This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. It's a pentagonal structure, 21 and a half million bricks strong. Sitting at the entrance to Pensacola Bay, it was built in the late 1820s in an effort to defend the Pensacola Harbor. Under Union control, it witnessed Confederate aggression, fire, dysentery, and even an Apache war leader and medicine man. It's Fort Pickens, and if you happen to find yourself at the western tip of Santa Rosa Island, you'll discover it right in your own backyard. The bricks in this fort tell stories that span 180 plus years. It's named after American Revolutionary War hero Andrew Pickens. Took about five years to build. Now you can wander through this beautiful structure on your own, or you can take a guided ranger tour as we did. Let's go. Well, without any further ado, we can go ahead and get started. And I'd like to begin this afternoon by welcoming all of you here to Gulf Islands National Seashore in Old Fort Pickens. My name's Mike Amon, and as a park ranger here with the National Park Service, this is one of the fun parts of my job. I get a chance to talk a little bit about the area, what makes it special, why was this set aside as one of 10 national seashores that rim our country's coastline, and one of over 409 national park areas now. This is the largest of the national seashores, and we actually extend about 160 miles along the northern Gulf Coast. And what I have planned for you folks this afternoon is a tour through the biggest and the oldest of the fort still standing here at the western end of Santa Rosa Island. Everything on the island is different than what you'll find right across the bay on the mainland. Everything out here has had to adapt to the wind, the sun, the salt spray, and overwash when hurricanes bring water completely over the island. But in addition to this beautiful natural areas, history abounds out here. And we've got a dozen fortifications here at the western end of Santa Rosa Island. As I said, we're in the biggest and the oldest. What prompted us to build all these forts along our shoreline? Well, to understand the forts, you have to go back to the last time we we're invaded by a foreign navy. And that's the big history quiz of the afternoon. When was the War of 1812? Everyone gets it right. Declared war in 1812. Most of the fighting actually occurred two years later in 1814. The British Navy sailed right up to the coast of America, burned down our brand new capital here at Washington, D.C. Dolly Madison, the first lady, is running through the White House, taking pictures down off the wall to save what she can. When the British Navy tried to get into Baltimore Harbor, they couldn't get past the big brick fort. And Congress said, this is what we need at every harbor entrance. We're going to start building these forts from Maine to Georgia in 1817, all the way down the East Coast. In 1817, they stopped in Georgia, though, because Florida was still Spanish territory. It wasn't until four years later, in 1821, that we paid Spain $5 million for the whole Florida territory. Not a bad deal if you price the condos out here on the beach today. A lot of coastline picked up. How do you patrol this territory? Well, you need a Navy yard right on the Gulf Coast. And they picked a little point of land about a mile and a half northeast of us called Tartar Point. Navy Yard was established in 1825. Spent a million dollars on a dry dock facility there. And after the Navy Yard was completed, they began work on one of three forts on the entrance to the bay. That's the one we're in now. Fort Pickens was constructed from 1829 to 1834 out of 21 and a half million bricks, making it one of the larger brick forts in the country. After they finished Fort Pickens, they crossed the channel, built Fort McCree on the eastern end of what's now called Perdido Key, and then moved over to the site of an old Spanish fort on the mainland. And they leveled one of the Spanish forts and built Fort Barrancas right on top of it. But there's a Spanish fort out in front of Fort Barrancas they decide was worth keeping, fixing up, putting new cans in it, and then they connected the two with a tunnel. So you have two levels of guns there. So we've got three forts right on the entrance to the bay. Any, for, any ship sailing in or out of the harbor is going to have to pass under the cannons of all three forts, well defended, but there's still one point of vulnerability, and that's 700 yards north of Fort Barrancas, a hill that Andrew Jackson put his cannons on when he took 
Florida from the Spanish, once in 1814 and again in 1818. If we didn't fortify that hill, somebody could do the same thing to us. So they built the fourth fort called the Advanced Redoubt on that hill, and these two were designed to work together to prevent a landward attack on the Navy Yard. So these are sound strategies, so sound that no one tried to get in. And people say, what a waste of time and money. The forts empty their entire history after spending all that money on them. And others say, no, the forts worked. People knew they were here, so they wouldn't even try to come in. And you can argue that back and forth all day. But one of the many ironies here is the only time these forts would actually see combat was something they were never intended for, and that's shooting at each other across the bay in the American Civil War with a very unusual turn of events in this area. January of 1861, there's 50 soldiers across the bay from us at Fort Barrancas, and a young lieutenant left in charge of those 50 men gets orders from Washington, D.C. They say, Florida has seceded from the Union. Hold all the forts. He's got 50 men, four forts, and the Navy Yard. He does get 30 sailors loyal to the Union, but those 80 look at their situation and realize they can't hold all four forts. The best bet would be to take everything they can carry and ferry it across the bay to Fort Pickens here and get this fort ready for defense. They made a wise move. Sure enough, Confederate troops moved in, took the Navy Yard, the Advanced Redoubt, Fort Barrancas, Fort McCree, but the 80 men at Fort Pickens refused to turn the fort over. They came out three times and demanded the surrender of Fort Pickens, and they denied them each time. One of the men that came out was a man named uh, Chase, and he actually supervised construction of the forts. And when Chase came out to demand surrender of the fort, Lieutenant Slammer, the man inside the fort, said, no, we're not going to let you in because we don't want you to see what we've done here in the fort. And Chase said, I built the fort. I know it better than anyone, he said, but we've changed things. All he'd done is taken the cannons that were pointed out into the Gulf and turned them to point across the bay. But sure enough, they refused to turn the fort over. And what they were doing was waiting for reinforcements to come in. Men and supplies were landed on the south side of the island, out of the range of the Confederate-held forts across the bay, making this one of the few forts in the deep south that never fell from Union control. So it's a little turned around. You had the north on the south side. The south was on the north side. But they did exchange cannon fire on a couple of occasions. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go through, a little bit about the fort itself and how it's changed over the years. It doesn't look exactly like it did when it was first constructed. So um, a good example would be this room. These are the officers' quarters. These were really the nicest rooms in the fort. It would have had a marble mantle over the fireplace originally, wooden floors in these rooms originally, wooden doors over the openings. Four men in a room like this, you could bring a little furniture from home if you were an officer, so this wasn't too bad. However, if there's officers in the fort, there's enlisted men. And if we were here in 1861 and looked out to that open field behind you, we'd see 1,100 men camped out. And that's where the enlisted men were, were housed or uh, out in what looked like little canvas teepees called Sibley tents. So 15 to 20 men in each tent. These things were made for about 10 men, but they were packed out here. And some of the accounts of the soldiers here during the Civil War period are some of the best information we have. They somehow kept a sense of humor. I don't know how. Heat exhaustion, dysentery took a huge toll out here. And these two adjoining officers' quarters were actually converted into a dispensary with up to 80 men a day on sick call for those ailments. So you can see even the officers didn't get to enjoy the luxury of their nice quarters. And that's when you have to remember that's not what the fort was all about. It was a place to put cannons. Inside arched rooms called casemates, like the one behind us we're going to take a look at in a moment, as well as up on top of the fort, what was called en barbette. The fort had over 220 cannons in place when it had its full complement of weapons. And all the original cannons were broken down for scrap and hauled off in the early 1900s. So none of the cannons in the fort are original to it. We have been slowly rearming Fort Pickens, though, and we have a cannon just like one that would have been placed here in the 1840s right around the corner. Before we leave this spot, though, a couple of things I need to mention. First of all, the fort was not built with safety in mind, so the floor is uneven, dark areas, low passages. Please exercise caution as we head through. Uh, secondly, if you get hot, tired, cold, sick, or listening to me talk, Feel free to drop out. I will not be insulted, but hopefully in the next half hour or so, you'll get a little bit better idea as to what the fort's all about. And finally, if you have questions, feel free to ask up, and I'll do my best to answer those for you. Let me take a look at Cannon right around the corner here. 
A cannon just like this one would have been placed here in the 1840s. This is called a 32-pounder smoothbore muzzle-loading cannon. And I'll tell you what all that means in just a moment. But we're going to talk first about the carriage that it's seated on. The cannon itself is historic. So it's from the 1840s. We acquired it from another national park site. The carriage was manufactured about 12 years ago up in Everett, Washington. So it's a reproduction. We sent the plans to these men. They sent us down a great example of a, a seacoast carriage from the 1840s. And before I go any further, I should let you know, when this cannon was in place, ready to be fired, the dumpster wasn't there, the brick building wasn't there, and the seawall wasn't there, and the, outside the fort, the ground was about eight feet lower than it is today. So you'd be looking right out onto Pensacola Bay from here. And this uh, old cannon, the 32-pounder, it's called that because that was the weight of the projectile, a 32-pound cast iron ball. Smoothbore refers to the fact that inside the barrel, it's just as smooth as the outside. There's no spiral grooves inside the barrel, so no spin on the projectile, and that's going to affect your range and your accuracy tremendously. And then muzzle loading simply means everything's going in from the front the same way it's going out. There's no opening at the back or at the breech of the gun here. Ideally, a team of seven men on a cannon crew, each one has a specific job. You're going to start out with a bag of gunpowder, one-fourth the weight of the projectile. So for a 32-pounder, eight pounds of gunpowder in a cloth bag, bring it up to the muzzle of the gun, pack it into the end of the barrel with a rammer on the end of a long pole like you see here. Roll that 32-pound cast iron ball in, make sure it's right up against the bag of gunpowder, and then come down here to the... The back of the gun, there was a small opening there that went down into the end of the barrel there called the vent. And one of the men on the cannon crew had a big leather pouch on his waist. He'd pull a long metal pin out of his pouch, poke it down through the vent, put a hole in the bag of gunpowder, and then fill the vent with more gunpowder. On top of that vent, he'd place a metal tube. It was hollow tube filled with gunpowder. It had a wire running perpendicularly through it. It's called a friction primer. This is how you actually can get fire to the powder in the barrel there. On that wire was the stuff like you find on a strike anywhere match, a little fulminated mercury, some other chemicals, and a loop in a wire would allow him to hook a rope or lanyard into that, and he's going to stand back holding on to the other end of the rope. Captain, I'll need some help with sound effects in just a minute because they won't let me fire the cannon in here, okay? The captain of the cannon crew climbs up on top of the carriage, sights the gun using these accurate sighting devices. Little notch here in the edge, pretty much just dead reckoning, and looking down the barrel. When he's satisfied with the way the gun's aimed, the order's given to fire, and the man holding that rope turns his face so sparks don't fly into it and gives that lanyard a tug, and that causes that wire to exit the tube, creating a spark as it does so, sends gunpowder burning down the bend, hits that back gunpowder, and boom! There goes that 32 pound cast iron ball hurtling forth a mile, maybe a mile and a half, in the general direction the gun's pointed. I say generally because these were notoriously inaccurate weapons. No spin on the projectile, but just enough room for a little bit of a wobble in there. That would give them kind of a knuckleball effect, and that grew with distance. So range, a mile and a half. Effective range, just under a mile. You could send a cannonball over to Fort Barrancas across the bay. It's a mile and a half away. But to actually do any damage to it, it would have to be just under a mile. 6,000 rounds were exchanged in two days, November 22nd and 23rd. Very little damage done to either fort. Park Ranger Mike Amons tells us that four of the five sides of the fort face the water. Now, only the east side is accessible by land, but it needed defending as well. Low passage here. Please watch your head. We're on the only side of the fort that could be attacked by land and a landward attack would have to come from the east the way most of you came in today unless you arrived by boat. There's an enemy coming from the east. The first thing you're going to be faced with, men with rifled muskets all along that shoulder high wall firing right back at them as they approach. Now if the men along the wall feel like they're losing ground, they're to come down these stairs behind me, upstairs and through these doorways we're using today. The idea is to get your men back into the fort and let the enemy come on down into the dry motor ditch. This is a bad place to end up. You're going to be fired upon from both sides. Small cannons called howitzers were mounted inside these embrasures or openings, and they fired a can with 48 cast iron balls an inch in diameter. So it was like buckshot on a large version, and they had a spray going with a crossfire, cutting down anyone trying to get to the main walls of the fort. Now this all made sense to me when I first heard it, but I did have a question, and that is how do you keep from shooting into each other's gun ports? They're right across from each other. 
That was answered well by the fact that this area has seen considerable change. It's something I alluded to when we were at the cannon, the fact that the ground was eight feet lower outside the fort than it is today. What happened? Well, 1906 hurricane swept over the island. The army's still out here using this end of the island for coast defense. They come back after the storm and said, we need more protection. And they built a massive seawall that goes all the way around this end of the island. It's about four feet across on the top, 10 feet across at the bottom, huge concrete seawall. They finished that, brought the men back out, started working them inside the seawall, and they started dropping out from the heat. Not a breeze stirred over that wall. They said, what we're gonna do is raise everything inside the seawall, get it up to the height of Fort Pickens Parade, and you always took a bridge up into the fort back then and stairs up through these doorways. So they filled all this in, and to give you an idea as to how much sand they ended up putting in around this end of the island by the seawall, there's just as many stairs below the sand as you see up above. So those two flights meet at a V down at the bottom. The embrasures or openings you see here for the cannons are halfway up the wall. So there's just as much brickwork below each one as above it. So you can see the fort's buried today by all that fill, and they would have been pointing those cannons down into the dry motor ditch so they didn't have to worry about firing into each other's gun ports. Let's head back into the fort. We got some original flooring down the hallway here. Please watch your step. It's settled a bit over the years. A nice thing to experience here are the sights, sounds, and smells within these walls. It's cool and damp in here, even in the summer. This was actually a row of officers' quarters at one time. These are rooms, the rooms we believe the Apaches lived in when they were held here as prisoners of war. And the story behind Geronimo and the Apaches begins with Geronimo's third and final surrender out in Arizona. He had left the reservation with about 100 men, women, and children. They had 5,000 U.S. cavalry troops chasing Geronimo and his band back and forth across the Mexican border. And they couldn't capture him, and they realized their best bet would be to hire Apaches as scouts to go talk to Geronimo and convince him to come down and engage in talks as it would be in his best interest. And they somehow convinced him to do so. He came down and met with General Miles at Skeleton Canyon. He was offered terms of surrender. One of those was he wouldn't be hung. Secondly, he'd be reunited with his family. According to records, Geronimo agreed to those terms, came down out of the mountains to Fort Bowie, Arizona. There's a train waiting for him, unbeknownst to him. The rest of the Apaches had already been placed on trains and taken over to St. Augustine, Florida. The old fort over there goes by its original name today, Castillo de San Marcos. It was called Fort Marion in the 1880s. It was being used as a big prison with over 400 individuals locked up in a fort built for about 250, so it was crowded over there. And that's where Geronimo's heading on the train. When Pensacolians heard about him coming through, and they actually heard about every time that train stopped, hundreds of people would come out to see the famous Apache warrior and medicine man. So they wrote a letter to the president. One of the quotes from their letter was, better place for great American general to wander through the old fort and consider his misdeeds of the past. They wanted to take some of the Apaches off the train and bring them out here to Fort Pickens. They received permission to take 15 men off the train, brought them by boat across the bay. They moved into the open-ended casemates on the west side of the fort. Finally, the wives and children were brought over from St. Augustine, and when the families were reunited here, they moved into these officers' quarters on the south side. These would have been the nicest rooms in the fort at the time. You had a fireplace for the winter, a breeze off the gulf in the summer. Never locked in any rooms, very much prisoners out on an island surrounded by salt water a long way from Arizona. But after a month and a half here, the Apaches were moved up to Mount Vernon, Alabama. That's north of Mobile, and they were there seven years finally out to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where Geronimo died in 1909. There are no flat ceilings in the fort. It's constructed using a series of arches designed by Joseph Cotton, who was with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Now, the whole entire system of forts was overseen by a fort expert from Europe, a man named Simone Bernard, who was in fact part of Napoleon's army. The bricks were brought in by barge from the north end of Pensacola Bay, $10 per thousand a penny apiece, put together with a mortar that consisted of lime shipped down from Thomaston, Maine, mixed with a little bit of sand and water. It made a good mortar, but over the years, the rain trickling down between the cracks and the bricks will cause that lime in the mortar to leach out, 
and that's what you see here, little soda straw stalactites, kind of a flowstone formation here along the side of the arch. These things more common in a cave or a cavern. Again, that's a result of that lime and the mortar leaching out. And when we see all that mortar leaching out between the cracks and the bricks, we're really glad they built the fort out of all connecting arches. And the arch is such a strong structural form, the weight of each brick leaning against the other will actually hold the arch together. We hope that principle holds true in places like this above you, sir, where there's no mortar left between the cracks and the bricks. Been lucky so far, haven't lost anyone a tour in a while, so we should be fine today. So you've got all this weight up above us, brickwork, earthwork on top of that, cast iron cans on top of that, all that bearing down on this arch, over this arch, into the piers on either side, which would cause the fort to sink and settle, were that weight not redistributed through the reverse arch, which keeps the fort from sinking in the soft sand here. And one of the big ironies here when you talk about construction of the fort is the fort was built to protect Americans' freedom by men that would never see freedom themselves. So enslaved men built the fort, 400 men, put the fort together over five years out of 21 and a half million bricks under the supervision of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And ironically, the only time the fort would see warfare was in the war that ended slavery as an institution in the United States. And I often say the fort is a monument to the men that built the fort. And we don't even know their names because they were treated as property instead of people. Civil War period here was the most active time. The first 18 months of the Civil War, that's when you had 1,100 men camped in the center of the fort here. And they're out here with their full wool uniforms buttoned up to the top button at all times while on duty, moving cans around, stacking cannonballs, getting hot and thirsty. Thirsty's a problem, there's no drinkable water on the island, but they built a system into the fort in which rainwater could be collected and rain would fall on top of the fort, trickled down through the earth, piled over the arches and drained directly into these cisterns or water storage areas. So that was their fresh water supply. And from all accounts, the, the cisterns worked pretty, pretty well until they really needed them in 1861 when all the men were here, they went four months with hardly a drop of rain. So the water in the cisterns got lower and lower and it stagnated and dysentery broke out, it was rampant out here. One of the treatments for dysentery in 1861 was a teaspoon of turpentine every morning. What killed more people? Dysentery, the intended cure, no one sure, but water was the biggest killer out here, more so than any kind of combat. Old Fort Pickens, state-of-the-art defense against a wooden ship under sail power with smoothbore cannon on the deck. A fort like this could stop an attack from a ship like that. By the time the forts were used in the American Civil War, when that conflict was over, all these forts we'd built on our shorelines were obsolete. What happened? Rifled cannons came into use, and those rifled guns could hit the same place over and over and knock a hole right through a four-foot solid brick wall, and that's what the Union Army did at Fort Pulaski outside of Savannah, Georgia. They brought their new rifled guns to bear on that fort, sat out of range of the Confederate guns because the rifled guns had a greater range and just started firing away, knocked a hole right through the four foot solid brick wall. The next thing you knock a hole through is gunpowder storage and before that happens, the flag of surrender goes up. All these forts we'd built on our shorelines were obsolete. So we need a new type of fort. And this is what they came up with, Battery Pensacola. It lacks the graceful architecture of the old brick forts with its sweeping arches. This is 1890s Battery Pensacola. Fort Pickens had over 220 cans. Battery Pensacola only had two. One up top on either side there, but those uh, guns fired a 1,070 pound projectile eight miles out into the Gulf very accurately. So the shift had gone away from the forts and into the artillery itself. When Battery Pensacola was being built in the 1890s, a fire broke out in the brick portion of Fort Pickens where construction supplies were being stored. They're passing buckets of water from the cistern. The fire kept spreading. The commanding officer saw where the fire was headed, formed his men up in the center of the fort, marched them right out through that arched entranceway and down the island to the east because the fire was moving into gunpowder storage where there was still 8,000 pounds of high explosives. It reached that room and blew the entire corner off the fort. Bricks went through people's roofs in Warrington a mile and a half across the bay at five in the morning. I'm sure a rude awakening for those folks, wake up with bricks coming through the ceiling, but it's why we no longer have a five-sided fort, but four sides with the big gap where they accidentally blew the corner off 
June 20th of 1899, and that's how Fort Pickens got its bay window. <laughs> it became a state park in 1947, and in 1971, it became part of a newly formed Gulf Islands National Seashore. Our goal, as in the other 408 national park sites, is to hold on to what we've been entrusted with, whether it's our cultural heritage, how our country defended itself in its earliest years, our natural heritage, these beautiful barrier island beaches that haven't and won't be developed. That's the idea behind your parks. And I appreciate y'all taking the time out of your day to join me. Thanks for coming out, y'all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. To get to Fort Pickens by land, take Highway 399 South onto Pensacola Beach. Then take Fort Pickens Road West to the ranger station, pay a toll, and continue about seven miles until it dead ends into the fort. If traveling by boat, just motor to the northwest end of Santa Rosa Island and anchor along the shore. We hope you've enjoyed this historic look at Fort Pickens, one of the mightiest forts to ever protect Pensacola Bay. We'll see you again next time, right in your own backyard. Thank you.